What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Camwood Bats live session. Um, we're here today. We've got a few new people with us today. Brian's sitting over here running the computer. We've got our buddy Wes Helms here today. Um, it's going to be just a little bit different. We're not going to jump right into questions right off the bat, but we are going to spend a little bit of time and just kind of let Wes tell us a little bit about himself. Um, I'm going to pitch it over to Trey and let him introduce him. I was introduced to Wes about a year ago. And I mean, just a great guy all around, great player, has a great mind, great coach about the game. And so, um, Trey, tell us who we got, man. So I'm really excited to have him on this podcast because uh, I've known Wes for years now because uh, back in the day, whenever Frank was working with me, he actually was uh, working with Wes as well. So uh, towards the back end of Wes's careers, whenever he found out about Cam Wood, but uh you know, he's a 13-year MLB vet, so he's been around the game for a really long time, and now he's had the pleasure of coaching. So he's coaching the professional players coming up through the ranks right now. So he has a vast wealth of knowledge about baseball. So, like I said, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Wes. So, Wes, you introduce yourself uh, to the people. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, man, I'm glad to be on here today. Um, like you said, you know, I played right at 13 years in the big leagues. I'm now currently the AAA manager for the Chicago White Sox, which we're in Charlotte, North Carolina during the season. Um, um, I basically, you know, long story short, kind of what got me into this, you know, I, I Frank uh, and I met kind of toward the end of my career, maybe 2009, 2010, and he introduced me to the Camwood bat, and I, and I absolutely loved it because, you know, I was a top hand dominant guy, and I was, you know, I was really had to focus on, um, you know, keeping the barrel, and then, and I call it delaying the barrel. My barrel would get away from me. So when, uh, when I met Frank and I got with the Camwood, it really taught me how to keep my hands inside the ball, delay the barrel, and it really helped me, you know, as a hitter. And it's funny, I was a better hitter kind of toward the end of my career than I was even at the beginning. And it's usually the other way around. You know, you get worse as you get older because you your reactions slow down, this and that. So it taught me a lot on that aspect. And then, you know, after I stopped playing in 2012, I helped at the high school here that my, my kids went to. I was just a volunteer. So I got to kind of see what kids were doing. And, you know, because, you know, I was around big leaguers all the time. So I wasn't around, you know, youth ball to see what these kids are doing. So when I started coaching high school, I started to see the things that kids were doing wrong, you know, and hitting or all aspects of the game, fielding, pitching or whatever. So it was my passion to try to give back and teach the way it should be done on a daily basis that, that can basically be put into effect at any age from T-ball all the way up to the major leagues. And, you know, we wanted to keep it simple and, you know, wanted to, you know, kind of build on that. So that's where, you know, that's what got me here today with, with Trey and Jonathan, all these guys, we just built that relationship and, you know, we're, we want to carry it further and, and reach out to all the baseball world and softball world and just teach these young kids and, and, and parents and coaches, uh, you know, how things are done to be consistent and how things are done on a daily basis, uh, you know, to be the best they can be. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear the phrase or I heard the phrase in my head last night, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I think that there's, a lot of different ways to do things, um, but I do think there's one way to do something right. Um, there's a best way to do it to get the most consistent result, and I think that's kind of what we have developed. I think that's kind of what you're talking about, you coaching high school and seeing what's not being taught or what's be, what's missing in players' game and in their development. And um, if we can get to a point to where we're teaching something consistent that shows consistent results, I mean, the game's going to get better in the long run. Yeah, that you know, just to harp on that, Jonathan, I mean, going back to there's more ways to skin a cat, that is true. But I think sometimes in the baseball world, especially, we get caught up, too many people get caught up into, you know, trying not to do the certain principles the right way. And they just let the kids kind of just evolve into what they are. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I mean, really, to kind of kind of go back to what you said, the size of the kid, the strength of the kid, the speed of the kid, those are the things that play into there's, you know, more than one way to do things. I mean, there's going to be power hitters. There's going to be average hitters. There's going to be slap hitters. There's going to be guys that can, you know, situational hitting is, is their, you know, top of their, you know, their like skill level or whatever. 
So that's the thing where there's more ways to skin a cat. But when it comes to the principles of baseball, if you watch every big league ball player hitting infield, outfield, pitching, whatever it is, at some, po- at some point during their movement, they're doing the same thing right. with consistent repetition. They're repeating that repeti- – they're repeating that delivery. They're repeating those that footwork. They're repeating – where their hands are starting, you know, through the zone. They're, every great player or every big leaguer does that. So that's the thing we got to make sure that these young coaches and kids and understand is, yes, there's more than one way, but we also have to stick to the principles that are the same in every single player. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So that brings up, you know, the reason I wanted to bring you on today is to really talk about two aspects of baseball. You know, the first thing I, I really want to talk about – uh, something that you already mentioned, and that staying inside the baseball. So as we know, and a lot of the people that have gone through our programs know, we teach you one thing, and that's how to stay inside the baseball. So that is the most important aspect to hitting right there. And like you say, saying, Wes, you call it delaying the barrel. So there's different ways to say it, different terminology. But, um, you know, what you mean by delaying the barrel is you're driving your hands and the barrel will stand behind the hands, and then the barrel whips through the zone, right? So therefore, you are staying inside the ball. Uh, with that terminology of delay the barrel. So, you know, we really think about the exact same things. Um, We're trying to teach the same things. We just might say it a little differently. So, you know, that's the thing I really want to talk about is why you want to stay inside the baseball, right? I'm sure, even Wes, I'm sure you've heard that term, stay inside the baseball your entire career. But a lot of people really don't know what that means exactly. So that's where, you know, we have the three T setup Mm -hmm. that Jonathan's going to demonstrate here that shows why we want to stay inside the ball. Because I always ask people all the time, Wes, as, as you're playing, how many times are you perfectly on time at the plate? I mean, you just absolutely crush the ball. Not many. I mean, you, I mean, that goes back to, to basic, you know, science. I mean, being perfectly on time doesn't happen often. I mean, exactly. it's, human, it's humanly impossible to react on time every single pitch, just with the speed, the spin, you know, velocity or whatever, it is humanly impossible. So, you know, that's why we cannot be in and out of the zone. We have to stay in the zone as long as possible so that we can adjust to the different spins and different speeds. If we get fooled out front, we can still keep our barrel through the zone out, you know, as long as possible to ride through it. And if we get beat a little, we can, we have our barrel back here that we can drive the ball the other way. So therefore being on time is huge, but it's not going to be perfect every single time. That's why it's so important that our barrel stays in the zone as long as possible. Exactly. Like whenever I ask players that question, the answer we get all the time is about 10% of that bat. So they're perfectly on time. So everyone's always harping about be on time, be on time. And they think hitting is about being perfectly on time as much as possible. But how is that possible whenever 90% of the time you're off balance, right? So if you want to be a complete hitter, it's about what you do those nine out of 10 at bats that your timing isn't perfect, right? So in order to maximize those results, you have to keep the barrel in the zone throughout the entire swing. And that's where staying inside the ball comes from, right? Yes. Let me, let me just kind of add one thing to that. To me, when I talk about being on time, I like to talk about being on time with when we get to the hitting position. So after we've loaded and we get to the hitting position, that's important to be on time. That should pretty much be as perfect as we can be every single pitch. But when it comes to when we commit our swing, that's when that 10% of being on time is there right. because of it is you know it is like I said humanly impossible to take that sweet spot of that barrel to the ball on time every single time. That's why you know we might catch it three centimeters out front or three centimeters or even inches behind. So therefore, that's that's where I want to kind of just say when being on time is important with getting to the hitting position, but being on time connecting to the baseball. That's where this uh, bat path is going to really help you limit those miss hits. Exactly. And that's why you see some of the greatest hitters of all time, you know, with the high average, like Albert Pujols, Miguel Cabrera, all these guys are masters at staying inside the baseball. I mean, the barrel of their bats in the zone throughout their entire swing. And that's why just like Jeter, you know, he 
the patented jeetering the ball to right field, that's because he drove his hands inside that ball. Yeah, he got beat and he was late, but because he was inside that pitch, he was still able to hit a hard line drive to the opposite field and get a base hit. So that's what we're talking about. His timing didn't have to be perfect in order for him to barrel that ball up uh, whenever yes. he went through his swing. So, yes. uh, and that's probably why today I'm sure you see it too. Averages are plummeting right now because everyone is so infatuated with hitting the home run that yep. they're trying to cause that lift through the zone and their barrels coming in too steep and they're not staying on playing with that pitch coming in. So their timing has to be perfect in order for them to barrel that ball up. Then that's yeah, why I mean, averages are going down. Exactly. I mean, for me, I'll be honest with you. If you want to be a complete hitter, the first first thought press, thought, thought process you should think of is keeping your barrel through the zone as long as possible and hitting line drives. Because if you hit a little under the ball, it's going to be a homer with strength or a double. And if you hit just a little above the ball, it's going to be a hard ground ball that can get through the infield. So if we try to create – the ball in the air consistently, then our strikeouts are going to be up, which to me doesn't play in a team aspect of baseball. It doesn't play with being the complete hitter. Strength, uh, homers come from strength. Strength comes from God-given ability and the weight room. Uh, and loft comes from keeping your bat through the zone as long as possible and catching the ball out front. That's where lift comes from. And you know, if we can stick to those things, then, you know, averages are going to be up and power numbers are going to be up. And that's what we're all searching for. We're not searching for just one thing. We want the complete package. Exactly. So I said, I you, hear, you hear that term. Mentioned, but you go ahead, Trey. I can't, I didn't hear you. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, um, you know, you hear that term stay inside the ball a lot, but no one really knows what exactly that means. So I was mm-hmm. going to kick it over to Jonathan to demonstrate yes. as to why you want to stay inside the baseball. Yeah, so basically, I mean, what we've got here is just a, the, simulating what we call the line of the pitch. If the pitch was thrown from the pitcher to the catcher, this is the line of which the ball is going to travel. And so, I mean, a lot of times you hear people, coaches and things, telling their kids to get the barrel of, of the bat to the ball, which is essentially what we want to do. But if we don't drive our hands inside the ball, we're not going to line that barrel up if we're later, if we're early. So if I'm here trying to hit this pitch that's in the middle, and I'm thinking about getting my barrel to it, then I may hit that pitch good if I'm dead on time. But if I'm back here, notice how much my, I mean, how far off I am from my sweet spot. Or even if I get jammed. Front, I mean, now I'm off the bat or swinging and missing. So Trey talks about staying inside. The space in between the ball and your body is inside of the ball. So if we can relax our hands, keep them nice and loose, and really just think about taking our hands as far as you can take them inside the ball with some speed, then what happens when you run out of room, the barrel naturally whips around and gets in line with that pitch all the way through the zone. And notice that my body's not even turned. So I haven't even, I haven't pulled off of this pitch. I mean, this is just straight A to B. I mean, knob to the ball, Tony Gwynn, trying to get from here to there as fast as possible. And if I'm late, I still hit it good. If I'm early, still hit it good. Probably hit that ball out. Pitch right down the middle, I, I scorch it. So inside of the ball, I mean, when I was coming up, my hitting coach taught me knob to the ball and we got a little bit distracted. A lot of folks talk about the ball on the tee. So they get in a position where they're going this direction to the ball. They're trying to go to the inside of the ball. I don't want to go to the inside of the ball. I want to stay inside of the ball. And so once I learned that, that really helped me in my career was learning that I'm not trying to necessarily hit my hands on the inside of the ball. I'm trying to drive my hands past the inside of the ball. So I give myself the most amount of time to make solid contact. Jonathan, that's a great point because if you think barrel to the ball, you know, in which a lot of people do, they don't understand that the eyes are going to tell the barrel where to go. Yeah. So all we have to focus on is starting our hand path. The barrel will get to the baseball. Our eyes will tell the barrel where to go. Our eyes see outside, down, up, middle, in. I promise you the eyes are going to dictate where the barrel goes after we start our hands. So we don't have to think barrel. 
But if we think barrel, then our hands don't know what to do. It's going to be our body taking over. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I, where I, I mean, we'll talk about it for a minute, but we see that all the time in here with these kids that we teach and we're taking through the program is that they're always very worried about getting this to the ball. And even, yeah. even kids with good mechanics, they have swings where they force the barrel just because it's natural human habit. That's what your natural right. tendency wants to do. So the reason that we've got to be consistent, like we talked about, we've got to make sure that we stay on the same concept. There may be a different way to explain it or a different way to teach it, but the concept has to be the same. We're trying to stay inside of the ball so we can maximize the length of time that we or the amount of time we give ourselves to make solid contact. Exactly. Good point. Ted, that's, uh, you know, that's where guys like Tony Gwynn, he always said, and Frankie's always say to me, wherever your hands go, the barrel is just going to follow naturally. Okay. So whenever I'm working with players, I never once teach them or have them think about barrel. When you start thinking barrel, you're going to be throwing those hands out around the ball. You're going to be coming around it and you're going to have to have perfect timing in order to barrel that pitch up. So if you just think hands, and whenever I'm working with players, I always tell them, just relax your hands and see how far you can drive your hands past the inside of the ball. Because once the hands get to a certain point, the barrel is naturally going to follow where the hands take it, right? So if you can just relax your hands and drive inside that pitch, the barrel's going to whip through naturally, and you're going to be able to barrel up a lot more balls because your timing doesn't have to be perfect in that situation. But, and as a lot of y'all know, here at Camelwood, we're all about hitting. Right. There's not many other things that we talk about when it comes to the baseball game. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have Wes on today is because uh, Wes actually oversaw uh, the Chicago White Sox entire infield. So he was there uh, during the COVID season working with all of those uh, pro infielders with the White Sox. You're talking Tim Anderson, Nick Madrigal, all those guys. So, Wes, I just wanted to have you come on and talk about uh, the infield a little bit, something that as a Camwood member, we really haven't touched on before. So this is going to be new to our audience. Uh, yeah, let me give you a little background on that, Trey, before, you know, and I've talked to you about this. Um, you know, I was always an infielder, you know, played a little bit of outfield with the Atlanta Braves, you know, never caught, pitched in high school, but infield was my thing. I was a shortstop, eventually got to third and first just because I was a big guy. I took pride in my infield. Well, I took pride in it. I worked hard on it. I did drills. I did this. I did that. But what's funny is I never totally understood how to be that complete elite infielder until I had six years in the big leagues. And I got with Perry Hill in Florida as my infield coach, which he's now the infield coach for the Seattle Mariners, the best of the best. Billy Ripken just said it on MLB Network the other day. He is the best infield coach to ever coach in the big leagues. And I back that because the things he taught me were simple were easy and it totally took me from a really good infielder to an elite infielder. I mean, I was going from even days when I wasn't starting in Florida, I was coming in for Miguel Cabrera at third base for defense in the eighth and ninth inning. So I actually made myself that elite infielder to be able to help out in ways even when I didn't start that game. So he taught me that after being in the big league six years. So I took all those things he taught me and put them together for myself, tweaked a few things here and there that I felt because, you know, I had that feel in my body of what I was feeling and I tweaked a few things. And then I've kind of rolled with that through my coaching in high school. Then in, now in pro ball, I was with COVID last year with the alternate site in Chicago, sending guys back and forth to the big leagues in 2020, not last year, 2020. And I handled all the infield. Uh, and then this year, being the manager of last year, being the manager in Charlotte, I handled all the infield with those guys that, you know, a lot of them played in Chicago last year as well. And I saw amazing results with these kids just by tweaking a few things with, you know, either their glove, their feet, you know, their direction, just their eyes, whatever it was, we worked on it. And, you know, it was just a passion for me. It was a just like hitting is always a passion for every baseball player. Fielding is not a passion for every baseball player. I'll tell you that. Yeah, you can, I can second that. <laughs> we're, in spring, we're in spring training. I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. We're in spring training with big league ball players and big league camp. They will go to the cage and all day long. They will play a game, be dead tired, go to the cage and hit more. Hardly, like I would say probably only 30% of them would take extra ground balls 
or ask for extra ground balls or fly balls or do the things they needed to do to be that elite infielder or outfielder. But all of them want to be the best hitter they can be. So that's another passion for mine is to carry that infield passion to get these kids, college players, high school players, pro players, that defense is just as important in hitting, especially if you have the mindset that you want to win. And that's what I'm all about is teaching these kids to win. So that's what it all came about with Trey and Cam Wood to, you know, get the infield involved. And, you know, that's where we're at today. Yeah, I think, I mean, I was an infielder in college. I mean, it was one of those things that I always did a lot of research on. I would search players. I mean, when I was coming up, I mean, you're talking Jose Reyes, Brandon Crawford, people like that, that were good infielders, but you could never really find any material that gave, for example, our Camwood program gives you an exact layout of this is what you do. Here's how to do the drill. Follow it like this and you're going to see results. There was nothing like that in regards to infield. Um, I knew, I know my work ethic and I know if I would have known about something like that, I mean, it absolutely would have been something I would have dove into. But, I mean, talk to me about that a little bit, Wes. I mean, how do you go into breaking stuff down, I mean, um, into different drills or, I mean, how many drills I mean, or reps per drill and things like that? I mean, a lot of folks would just take, I mean, the simple right on, forehand, backhand, fungos, and then let's go, let's move on. Uh, well, that's a good point, Jonathan. Let me just kind of harp on that. So, you know, you can watch a big league infielder. You can watch a big league outfielder. You can watch a big league hitter. And you can see what they do. Mm -hmm. But I think what a lot of coaches and parents don't realize is what does that player feel? What is going through his mind when he's yeah. doing these things? How does he get to that point? You know, when is his when is his timing of being ready for the ball to hit? You know, there's so many things that go in to infield, outfield, and all these different thing, aspects of the game that unless you have been there and had that, you know, experience of just thousands of games – doing the same thing over and over, sometimes it's tough to watch a video and say, all right, I'm going to do that. Well, what's he thinking? Why is he doing that? That that might not be the same on a ball over here. You know, there's so many aspects. So for me, you know, it was, it was breaking it down just like Perry did to make it simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, you start with teaching the kids exactly what to do. Maybe, you know, maybe just understand, hey, the hands. What do we do with our hands? You know, what do we do with our footwork? What do we do? How do, what do we do with our direction? Mm -hmm. And, you know, cause for me, it's all about building muscle memory. It's all about consistency, just like hitting. We want to repeat that path, repeat that path. We want to repeat, you know, our footwork and our, you know, we want to repeat the reps with our hands to make sure our hand angle and direction are the same. So we want to make sure all these things that, you know, that we really think about once the game starts, we don't think about them. It right. just happens. So, you know, when you formulate a program, you know, it's, 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 it's extensive. I mean, you have to put the work in. It has to be a lot of reps daily. It has to be pre-practice. It has to be pre-game. It has to be, you know, a daily routine done at home, throwing a ball off the wall. Whatever it is, it has to be done. And the most important thing is once you do the program, then it's important to continue to do these drills to stay consistent every single day because I use the terminology like when you're working out you know you've worked out for you know whatever eight ten months and your body's looking good and you feel good and all of a sudden you take two weeks off you've lost like 30 to 40 percent of what you've gained in those six to eight months mm -hmm. just by taking two weeks off so you have to make sure that you stay consistent with drills and reps and you know it's just like I said it's a daily thing and that's what you know that's where the passion comes in. If you really want it, you will be the best infielder or outfielder or whatever you can be just by doing the reps and doing them the right way. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the, the one thing that I took from what you were saying is you didn't really understand the advance and the elite side of infielding until you were six years into the big leagues. Yes. I mean, to me, that that's crazy. And, um, you know, what are some of the things? Because, like, whenever we do hitting, you know, the reason the all American program was so successful is we gave a blueprint, you know, we gave our customers um, the fundamentals to learn how to stay inside the ball. Right. And then once they go through the program, we taught them that blueprint and how to stay consistent and how, like, even after the program's over, we continue to do those drills daily. So basically 
we're setting up a daily routine for them to do in order to have success in the game, right? So whenever you worked with Perry, what exactly did he do six years in that helped you become that elite infielder? Because it sounds like something that he uh, created, like a simple fundamental routine for you to do on a daily basis that really helped you. Okay, basically what he told me, he kept it simple. He said, Wes, you're relying on your talent and you're not using that talent to be the best you can be. You are just relying on the ball's hit, catch it, throw it. That's all you're doing. And he goes, you're pretty good at it, but you're not as good as you can be. And that's how he handled players. I mean, he basically told you, you're here, but let's get you to this point. Mm -hmm. So he broke it down basically, and I'm not exaggerating, to a little league level. He broke it down to me and said, we're going to start right here, and we're going to roll balls, and we're going to make sure your footwork, your hands, your eyes, your you know, the uh, your posture of your back, everything is where it should be. And we're going to do this every single day until your body feels like it can do it without you thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I'm going to stay on you. Every ground ball hit to you in a spring training game, every ground ball hit to you in batting practice when you're taking your fungos, we're going to watch you. But we're going to do these simple drills every single day and you're going to see how it's going to carry over to your fungos in batting practice or in practice and in the game when you have a ball hit to you. And it did. I mean, it clicked. It was, you know, it took a little time, but I'm telling you, it made me so consistent when the ball was hit to me, how my footwork was in place or my feet were in place. My, I was, you know, my legs, my posture, my eyes never – you know, I never lost the sight of the ball, the bounce, the speed, whatever, because of these simple drills. It just brought it back to a little league level, man. It just was like, you know, the only thing difference in the big leagues and little leagues, the guys hit the ball harder at you. Yeah. And it's the same thing. I mean, fielding's the same from, you know, tee ball up. There's a certain way you do it. It's just as you move up, the ball's coming at you a lot faster. So he, he just dumbed it down. That's what we like to say. We dumb it down. And we keep it simple, but it's going to really make you understand what it takes on a daily basis to make all the routine plays. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, as I'm obviously, you know, we have we've had a relationship for the past few years. And every time I talk to you about infielding, I can tell that that is your passion, teaching infielding. Right. And uh, I think it is, Trey, real quick. Sorry to butt in. I think it is only because I know every player loves to hit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a, a kid comes out of his mother with a bat in his hand if he wants to play baseball, but he doesn't come out with a glove. So what's the first present you buy your kid? The big Mickey Mouse plastic bat. That's the <laughs> first present you buy your kid. You don't buy him a glove. So I think it's a passion for me to just, I think, just throw into these kids what I know in all aspects of the game because it takes – it's more than one area – that makes you a baseball player. It's not just hitting. It's not just fielding. It's not just pit. It's everything combined. So I think that's where, you know, I get this passion for the infield. So whenever you're working with all the players, are you taking these exact same drills that Perry taught you to whenever you're coaching a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, or someone in the big leagues? Are you doing these drills no matter what the age is? Same thing with, you know, like I said, T-ball, little league, uh, high school, uh, college. I mean, my son's a freshman at Auburn this year. He still continues to do these drills on a daily basis. Um, and pro ball, we did all these drills with our AAA guys this year. We do them. We did them. Uh, you know, at the alternate site during the COVID year. This is part of our daily routine. It doesn't take long, and it is. You know, it's the necessity for us to understand that this is part of everything that goes on before we even think about being that you know great infielder in the game. So like I said, as I'm talking to you, like I said, I can just tell that infielding is your passion. And, mm-hmm. you know, that is why I reached out to you um, to ask if you were interested in doing a full-on infield program uh, for the Camelot customers. Because obviously we do hitting, and that's all we've done up to this point. But like I said, whenever I was talking to you about infielding, I just knew that this is something that you could help our customers become an all-around better baseball or softball player. So I had the pleasure of going down to Birmingham uh, last week to meet with Mess or meet with Wes and go over these drills that he's talking about with Perry. And so, Wes, if you want to uh, talk a little bit about the program that that we're going to be partnering on. Yeah, man, I was so excited, Trey, when you asked me to 
you know, if I would do this, uh, I mean, honestly, like there was no hesitation whatsoever by me. It was like, let's go with this. So, yeah, we, uh, so what Trey was talking about, I created a 30 day infield program and it's all about the fundamentals and the basics of, you know, the routine play. I'm always, this, this is the building block of the, you know, sports center plays and the diving plays and, everything that gets more advanced. You have to have a building block for those things. I mean, you can't expect to make the great plays if you can't make the routine plays. So the 30-day program, it basically breaks it down daily, days one through 30 with some off days in there. You start small and at the end, we're at the point where each kid, you know, baseball or softball is going to be as consistent as they can be with all aspects of making the routine play, you know, Adam backhand glove side. Uh, and, you know, cause the, let me explain this Trey. Like the importance of this is not only to be the best infielder you can be. The importance of this is what does it bring to your team? You know, the more routine plays we make as filters, the less runs we give up overall the less pitches that are put into that pitcher on the mound. I don't know how many times I've seen it even at the pro level where we've booted a routine play and our pitcher could have got out of that sixth inning and completed six innings where then now we've had to take him out with five and two thirds and get into our bullpen before we wanted to. That's where, you know, everything comes full circle when you think about it on a team aspect. So it was a, so creating this program not only is for the player, but it's also to make it's, it's to make your kid or, you know, a pro player, a college player, whatever it is, the best infielder they can be, but also be the best they can be, you know, to make the routine plays for their team. Yeah, sure. And like I said, uh, the good thing is, you know, we just filmed this program. And I'll tell you, I wish I had something like this whenever I was in college, because I'm sure as you all know, I was a hitter. I'm the guy Wes was talking about earlier. After a game, I'm in the cage for three hours. That was me. I didn't take on any extra ground balls, and I wish I would have because maybe I would have gotten drafted if I was a more well-rounded baseball player because all I was known for was hitting, right? So, like I said, uh, I'm happy to reach out to Wes, and I'm glad. I'm really happy that he accepted to come on, partner with Cam Wood, and help us teach all aspects of baseball, not just hitting. So, um, I think we're going to go up. Trey, real, real, real quick, Trey, before you go into that, let me just say this, and this is a funny story. The game's different today because of how athletic the game, you know, has become. I mean, with with training, strength, and conditioning, these players are bigger, stronger, faster than you know. Even when I was in pro ball, or even when I was in high school, it's just different. Well, it's great, you know. I wish I had all those things when I was, you know, growing up. But the thing is, it's made it harder for a kid that doesn't know how to field a ball. He can be the best hitter. In college, he can be the best hitter in high school. That doesn't mean he's getting drafted because I was having a conversation with a kid the other day that was an absolute dominant hitter but cannot catch a cold. Like, it is like he's allergic to the baseball. And I had to sit down and talk to him and say, look, you got to understand this. They don't, uh, they don't draft DHs anymore. DHs evolve in the game. So, in other words, you don't get drafted just to be a DH. You get drafted as a player, and then as your career gets going, you can evolve into a DH if someone else comes in and he takes your position, but they need your bat. So, that's where I want to just explain to everyone that, you know, that the fielding is so important in today's game because of how athletic this game has become. They don't just draft hitters. You know, they draft hitters that also know how to play a position. Players, yeah. yeah. Sure. So uh, if any of y'all are interested in learning more about the info program that we're partnering on, uh, I just put a link in the chat. Like I said, we're, we're aiming for a March 1st launch for the infill program, but we're uh, going to put an option for you to sign up to get notifications when it comes out because whenever we first launch this, we're only accepting 100 players in the first round. So if this is something you're interested in, click the link that I put in the chat and uh, get signed up to be notified. And once uh, we get closer to launch, we will definitely keep you updated because trust me, this is something that you're going to want for your player 
that's going to help them become the best player they can be. And like you said, the best teammate as well. Right. So Jonathan, I'll kick it over to you. Like I said, we'll do FAQs for the rest of the time that we have here. So Jonathan, I'll kick that over to you. Yeah. So basically, I mean, we know we have a lot of new customers in here. Basically what we normally do every Thursday, we have a live FAQ session for all the people going through our Camwood bats 30 day hitting program. Um, there's probably 17, 18,000 people across the country that have, been through this program the results have been just astronomical it's kind of like we were talking about earlier the consistency of the results is what is, is what impresses us the most kids are becoming better hitters of all sizes all ages um, so we're really just going to kind of open the floor up to our customers that are going through that program um, if any of you guys have any questions in regards to the drills that your kids are working on or going through just type those in the chat box raise your hand and ask and we can unmute you um that would be a little bit better way to do it it'd be a little more um a little faster that way if you if you just want to raise your hand we'll unmute you and talk about it um but again we have our text hotline so feel free if you're just getting into the program or if you're possibly you may end up in the program after this we do have a text hotline that basically comes straight to us the camwood coaches where you can text videos of your players going through those drills for us to go through and critique and give them good feedback to help them see the most results possible. Um, so and that's where we're seeing the results. We're giving our customers the, the ability to reach out only to get critiques and the right advice on making sure you're doing the drills correctly. And that's another thing, like when I talked with Les, I said, if we're going to do this, uh, you know, you need to be in the, in the chat, the private chat, interacting with the customers they know they're doing the drills correctly right so like i said it's just a huge advantage to be able to have someone like wes inside of the chat interacting with you one-on-one -on -one with the knowledge that he has when it comes to hitting and infielding right all right we got somebody with a hand raised right here all right kick my camera all right we're trying to unmute you right then if y'all have a question to ask uh me jonathan or wes raise your hand like i said it's well, okay. if y'all have any questions, I mean, every day you get to be able to ask questions to, you know, a 13-year MLB and yeah. um, White Sox coach, you know. Mike, how's it going, buddy? Hey, guys, how y'all doing today? Good, man. What's going Good on? Work. I'm just trying to get some clarification. My son's been through the 60-day program. Um, yes, I've seen some great results. Kind of bumping up against a couple of parents on my travel team that I hadn't seen anything to do with top hand in Camwood. Correct. And I've searched, you know, for it. It's not in the 60-day program. I've looked for it. Right. And they're acting like they've seen it somewhere or whatever. And I'm just trying to get clarification on that so that I'm not missing something and I'm not, you know, I'm not telling them something wrong. Um, basically what they're talking about, we teach a top hand release in the Camwood program. We don't, like Wes was saying very, right off the bat in the uh, very beginning of the session, he was a top hand dominant hitter. I was one of the same, I was the same way. So my top hand caused me to basically get my bat. If this is the line the pitch is coming on, my top hand causes me to go across that line. So what we teach is that we lead with that bottom hand and our top hand is guiding our bottom hand, helping, helping the bat to become a little lighter, if you will. So we can get through the ball. Once we get through the ball, with speed, our bottom hand has a little bit more extension than our top hand does. So it's naturally just gonna come out of the hand and finish. Um, right, and, that, and that's exactly the way I, we, well, they're wanting to do, they're doing top hand drills with the one-hander. Right, and, and so, I mean, we don't take, we don't necessarily do that with players. I mean, some Trey's right. had to do certain things. I mean, a lot of times yeah. it's a feel thing, but if they're doing right. that and it's causing them to get into this position when they swing, yeah. And we've got to get it out of their top hand and get it in that back in that bottom hand because this is the hand that's got to lead us to the ball. If we start yeah. doing this, we're chicken winging and everything's dumping back in the ground. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly what I tried to get across to them. I, th I thought I thought the exact same thing, but I was like, I'm gonna get clarification today. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, hey, man, absolutely glad to help, buddy. Perfect. Well, I, I know a lot of players do that top hand drill because they're trying to teach that palm up because obviously mm -hmm. you've heard the term palm up, palm down. Yeah. So they're trying to teach that palm up with the top hand, which is going to get you that extension through the ball. But like I said, what you don't want to get to is where that top hand's rolling to swing that mm -hmm. and that. Because if they get that rollover, 
that's where you're getting jammed, right? Because yep. we always want a top hand to stay palm up throughout the entire swing. So yep. get that good extension through the ball. So whenever, like Frank taught me, you know, the, the top hand, like it's, yep. it's just on the bat. That's why whenever he used to do drills with me, he would put a board in my hand and literally I couldn't close it. That way the, the hand had to come off at contact because he didn't want me to get in that top hand dominant. So does that yep. make sense? It sure does. I appreciate it. Hey, Mike, real quick on that top hand. Uh, be, make sure – some maybe bring this up to some of those parents that, you know, I know a lot of pro guys like, like to do some top hand stuff, like Trey said. It helps them stay palm up. You know, the, and they, may, they might kind of get around the ball. And, you know, it'll fix that. But the, what, what we're seeing is they're starting to, you know, have some elbow issues. And most of the time, your top hand is your throwing hand yeah. in most hitters. So – we're starting to see that, you know, over repetition over time, they're starting to get some arthritic activity in that elbow just because, you know, over and over and over, you're you're using your top hand hitting. Now you're using it throwing. That's a lot of overload on that elbow. So I wanted to bring that up that we are starting to see some of that with the one hand top hand and throwing. That's a lot on that right, uh, right or left elbow. And, you know, something to watch, you know, especially if they want to do it a lot. I appreciate that. That's well. That's that's something I didn't know, Wes. That's very impressive. I didn't. That's good information right there. Everything right now, I'll tell you. That's what I love. New age training and the science of training is. It's all about workload, man. Of how the body can handle what it can't uh-huh. handle. Keep us on the field. Keep us healthy. If I'd have known that when I was young, man, I probably could have played until I was forty-five years old. Right. But I just ran yeah. myself on the ground, and you know, I was very fortunate to play thirteen could have played a lot longer if I'd have known some of this new age stuff about workload and, you know, maybe, you know, taking care of your body more. Right. Um, we got a question right here in the chat. What's more important for developing young infielders to overcome the fear of a hard hit ground ball um, or to develop the confidence with the routine, uh, with routine grounders? So I'll let you kind of chat on that, Wes. So for me, the fear, the fear of the ball coming at them comes from the infielder not being confident in their fielding ability. So, we got to build that fielding ability first. And that's where the program comes in. It builds that, that consistency. It builds the confidence in the young player. Or like I said, as we get older, you know, younger players are going to have more of the fear of the ball hitting at them than the older players. But if we build that confidence in our hands, our footwork, eyes, you know, our posture, uh, being on time, whatever it is that we explain in that program, it's going to build confidence in you know, the fielder that they're not going to be scared of the ball because they know they can field it. So a lot of that fear comes from, you know, not being confident in themselves that they're going to catch, catch the ball. So I think uh, once you do these drills and the, and the player gets confident, that's going to take a lot of that fear away because they know that they're, you know, after this program and if they continue to do the drills that they're going to, you know, be able to catch these balls. So therefore that fear goes away. Yeah, I would relate that a lot to, I mean, somewhat to the hitting program. A lot of young kids are scared when they get in the box of the ball coming I mean, from the pitcher to the catcher and they get into this right here. But, I mean, the young, the young kids that we take through the program, as they get into it 30 days, 40 days, and they get a little bit of a, a skill about it and they understand what they're doing, I mean, they're not scared of it anymore because, again, they know what they're doing. They know exactly how to do it. And so then it's just now it becomes a game. Now is when it gets to be fun. Well, success kills uh, success kills fear. So if we train ourselves to be the best we can be and we start having success with it, that fear goes out the door. Hitting, yeah. pitching, fielding, whatever it is. I mean, you know, to do the drills, to have that success is going to take that fear and minimize it, you know, every week, every month, and eventually that fear is gone. So I think if we focus on the success part with doing the drills and, and being the right fielder or doing the drills and being the – the hitter we need to be, that fear eventually goes out the door. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, John right here was asking, no palm up, rear hand drill. Yes, that's basically what we were saying. A lot of folks we're seeing kind of going into that top hand drill with the Camwood bat. We're not telling you not to do it. But, again, like Wes said, they're starting to deal with some workload issues with players in their dominant arm because of their them doing top hand drills and throwing and all the stress that's going into that arm. So – You've got to pay attention to it. I mean, me, if you're asking me if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it because I know that now. So I'm just going to make sure that I drive my bottom hand right and use my top hand as a guide. 
Um, very good. Jonathan, I would say real quick, if that is going to be a part of your routine, I would minimize the reps and I would definitely not do that on the daily basis. Like every other drill, I would just kind of use that as needed, like a, you know, as needed standpoint, rather than doing that as part of your routine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another one here. Uh, they're asking about the video of this. Is it going to be available? Yes, they, we will be posting this on YouTube. So you'll be able to access this very shortly after, after this session ends. Um, if you see a young player is almost lunging forward to swing the weight of the cam wood, do you recommend stopping to wait till they get a little stronger? No, we don't. We basically recommend going into how we teach the hands drills. Um, this is, again, something that we deal with very often. A lot of kids, they – Number one, they stand too close together when they're trying to swing this big old bat. They got too much weight up top. And it's like, I mean, it's like having a tree with a big, big, big top and a small trunk. It's going to fall over as soon as the wind blows. So we've got to spread their feet out in a sense to where they can feel their feet in the ground. Um, my partner, Brian, here that works with me in the shop and with Camwood talks about digging your feet into the sand, really feeling like I'm trying to drive through the ground with my feet as my hands go there. So I don't have any move in my upper body. We've got to really control our center, our core, when we're doing these hand drills and you're trying to move this heavy bat. If they get to a point where they're real tight in their grip or in their hands, they're going to be going into that position. So loosen those hands up nice and relaxed, real loose fingers, open top hand, and feel themselves control the abs. Use their abs to stay still rather than their grip to stay still, if that makes sense. Weight shift training day for the fast pitch softball players. Is that a crossover training item for softball and baseball? It is. Um, me and Trey get this question all the time. I mean, do how do you teach a softball player compared to a baseball player? The exact same. We're taking a round ball and a round bat and trying to hit it square, and they're both moving in a straight line. So it's the same exact thing. That weight shift is going to play into the softball swing just like it would in a baseball swing. That's what I say. You know, like I said, we get asked that question all the time. Can we do this program or the All-American program if I have a softball player? And in my perspective, a swing is a swing. It don't matter if it's baseball or softball. We're teaching a swing. And, you know, what's funny is my – Softball girls probably get more results than the baseball guys do. Well, I mean, like the, said, girl, like, the girl we posted about today, you know, same kind of thing. Exactly. Like I said, I mean, you're you're teaching one swing. So there's no difference between the two. Like I said, we get awesome results with the softball players just as much as we do the baseball. Yeah, and if you guys have Instagram, you could go to Camwood Bats Instagram and check out a reel that we posted today of one of our softball players swinging – uh, a two-hand cam wood trainer that's 37, nine ounces, maybe 39 ounces, and then a um, cam wood 271, a wood bat, I mean, a, a baseball bat, swinging it better than some dudes that we have. And the way that it makes her game bats, I mean, just stupid light, her hands are unbelievably fast. Um, so, I mean, it just proves that it works for both sides. This guy says he's having a hard time with his player on the infielder. Uh, stabbing his glove at the ball, what may be a good drill to curb the stabbing of the glove? Well, I mean, you know, there's so many things that go into stabbing at the glove, and that's what this 30-day uh, program is kind of, you know, that's part of it, and that will be explained in the program. That's part of, uh, you know, getting those soft hands and making sure that, you know, we're approaching the ball the right way, making sure our glove, the glove angle is is important. But, uh, you know, that, that's where this 30-day program is going to cure all those little things that young infielders do. You know, young infielders usually make the same mistakes. You know, they just run to the ball, stab at it, and then they throw it. And that's what we want to kind of, you know, fix at a young age so as they get older it becomes natural. You know, I never, I never say it's too late, but – you know, if we want, if we wait to a certain point to try to teach these infielders as they get into their, you know, playing career, if we don't start them as, you know, a young infielder, it's a lot harder to teach them when they get older because they've built such bad muscle muscle memory and it's hard to fix 
fast. We want these infielders to be able to do it at a young age, and it just carries with them all through their playing career, however far it takes them. So, you know, I would give you some drills on here, but I don't want to take away from that program because you can do just one drill, and it might fix that, but that doesn't mean it's fixed all the other things he's done to lead into stabbing the glove. That's so true. that's why it's important to do the drills in sequence and order. And there's a, you know, there's a philosophy behind it and, and it really works. So, you know, that's, that's basically what I would say is do the complete program and it will fix not only the stabbing, but everything else. Yeah. And I feel like whenever a player is stabbing at it, like I have a picture in my head of them, like they're not in the ready position before the ball is hit to them. Right. So they're like, yeah to react to it, they're just stabbing their glove down at the ball. So, I mean, if, if, like if they just got in the ready position before the ball was hit to them, that would cure a lot of it right there. Yeah. Yes. But. Very good, guys. Um, how far should young players stand from your pro tee, especially when using the insider rod? Uh, we just posted a video inside of the program portal this week where you could see exactly how we uh, set up to that outside pitch. But I'll show you right here. Basically, all we do is we take the end of our bat, and line it up. For example, I just put it on in line with the ball. And then I, would, I adjust my feet to where I feel my feet flat underneath my body. I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to lean or where I'm too upright. I want to feel like I'm as far out as I can go without being uncomfortable and feel my feet flat underneath my body. And that's where they're going to line up for these hand drills in the 30-day program. Weight shift drill, pipe drill, anything in regards to an outside pitch. That's how that's how we line up to it. Make sure that we're far enough away, good, solid base, and then we just pick our hands up and we're ready to hit. Um, yes, this he's, he said what up? Any yeah, stuff in the program? Making an appearance. Uh, young infielders' confidence toward being scared of the ball. We mentioned that just a minute ago. I mean, the more reps you do with something, the more skill, the better you develop. Um, that skill, the more confidence you're gonna you're gonna bring with that. So the infield program that's coming out, the Camwood All American 30 Day program that we have, the hitting program, we're seeing that inside of that program, and it's it's gonna be the exact same with the infield program. The more kids work at getting better at that specific thing that makes them a better infielder, they're gonna gradually become a better infielder. Um, like you say, they're gonna gradually uh, become not scared of the ball. The better they get. This is a. I'd like to hear an eight, everybody's guess on age. What age do most bad habits become difficult to change? Mm. And that, that that's probably different in every player. Uh, you know their skill level, basically their mindset. You know, I mean, you got to think about this. There's there's pro guys that you know we draft. They'll come to rookie ball. Some, you can work with them right away, and they're going to get it within the first two days. Some of them, it'll take that first season for them to understand it and really put it into effect. So, you know, like when I got with Perry Hill six years in the big leagues, it didn't happen right off the bat, you know, in spring training for me with these drills to get to that elite infield status. So even for me, being a big league ball player, it took me probably a month or two to all this start to become comfortable and, you know, all those habits that I was doing, uh, you know, become comfortable. So it all depends on the player. I mean, you really can't, can't – you can't label like, okay, at 10 years old or 11 years old. We, use, we just have to use the thought process that the younger we get to them, the easier it's going to be along their playing career. That's the way we look at it. We get to these young kids, uh, teach them the right way. It makes it easier – as they get older, we get them when they get older, they have to understand that it's going to take a little time to change some of these habits and do the things the right way. So we really just don't put an age on. It. Yeah. And I would go, I mean, piggybacking off what you say right there. I mean, the older kids, they have to be willing to change. They've done it for a lot longer period of time. So they, and some of them in their own mind feel pretty confident in how they do things. So unless they change up here, you're not going to get a lot of physical change in the stuff that you're trying to get them to do. They have to be open and willing to make adjustments in their own swing um, or their infielding routine or whatever the case may be to see that improvement. It's just going to take them longer to see it. Yes, because one of the things you're going to hear 
from kids that have done it, you know, kind of had some bad habits for a while is, well, this doesn't feel comfortable to me. (laughs) And that's where as a coach, a parent, you have to be open-minded, but you also have to get them to understand that, yes, it doesn't feel comfortable because you've done it wrong for so long. But if you, if you stick with it and stick to the, I always say stick to the process. If you stick to the process, I promise you it's going to become, become comfortable and then there's no looking back. You're going to be where you, you know, where you want to be. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree 100%. Mm-hmm. Very good. I'd also throw in, you know, sometimes when they change is when they absolutely have to. Whenever yes. I was working with Frank, Very he, uh, Frank sat me down and said, hey, if you don't focus on what I'm trying to teach you, I'm going to quit working with you. So whenever he hit me with that ultimatum, that night at that game, I was like, all right, because Frank was trying to teach me how to take that outside fastball and drive it to the opposite field gap, right? And I kept trying to pull everything. So whenever I got in the game that night, I actually took that approach to the game. And my very first at bat, I hit a double off the right center field wall. So whenever he hit me with that ultimatum of, you're, you're going to have to change or I'm going to stop working with you, is when – I really focused in on it, and that's what made me a good hitter because I realized I could take that ball off the right center field wall just as easy as I can to left center. So now the entire field has opened up to me as a hitter, and then three years later I was an All-American once I learned that mindset. Yes. Absolutely. Um, Mindset is is key in in anything that these kids are going to do for the rest of their life, number one, but especially – I mean, especially in baseball whether you're pitching, fielding, hitting, catching, playing the outfield, sitting the bench, I mean, on the injured list, whatever, you're going to have to have the right mindset and go about it the right way. And basically, we're kind of to the end of our questions right now, so we'll kind of wrap up on that end. Um, Trey, if there's anything else pressing that you want to mention, I'll kind of pitch it to you and let you let you talk about, um, I mean, anything else right here at the end. I was just going to say, you know, it's we're an hour in. I, I want to be respectful to Wes's time as well. So I said, uh, I guess we'll wrap it. If no one has any other questions, you know, this is your last call, raise your hand or put it in the chat. But otherwise, like, we'll, uh, we'll close this thing out. And Wes, like I said, I appreciate you coming on, man. Like I said, I'm looking forward to the things that we're going to do together in the future. No, man, I appreciate you having me. And like, you know, like you just said, uh, big things are coming with Cam Wood. You know, we're going to, we're going to teach all these, you know, kids and, you know, even older players to be the best they can be at all aspects of the game. And that's our passion. And, you know, I'm looking forward to be the one that's going to be a part of this journey. And, you know, we're going to be able to reach a lot of people and, you know, the pride and joy as a coach, man, is to look back and see the people you've touched and see how good they've become down the road. So that's our ultimate end goal is to make this personal. That's why I'm going to be in the chat room. I want to be involved with, the people that buy the programs and, and really are working and have questions for me to even get better and lead you in the right way. Cause I want to touch these kids. I want to touch these coaches and parents to make sure that, you know, we get these players the best they can be. That's going to keep this game, you know, played the way, the way it's supposed to be played. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Well, guys, we sure appreciate all of your time, Wes. Thank you so much. If you yeah, do not have um, the Camwood 30-day program or the Camwood bats, we highly encourage you to go get you one. We just posted the link in the chat uh, to that website. So thank you again. Guys, we'll see you next Thursday. Have a good one. See you guys. See, see you guys. Guys.